Good morning and welcome to worship today here at Grace Lutheran in Boone, North Carolina. I'm Pastor Steve and on behalf of our whole congregation, I want to welcome you as we gather to worship together in our online way. Just a couple of announcements for you. A reminder that we do have our new pictorial directory available in the email on Thursday. There was a way that you could order a paper copy or as we're sort of encouraging folks, digital copies as well. What's nice about a digital copy of this is it would, would come to you as a PDF. Uh, and then as we add new members or get more photos of members, it'll be constantly updated so it's always up to date. But uh, a lot of hard work has gone into this process. Uh, Sabina, Sam, many, many others, uh, Martha. And so, hey, we are, we are there and order yours today. Uh, I held this up last week maybe, uh, but we also have our chili cook-off. It is next Sunday, February the 11th, directly following worship. It's our annual chili cook-off uh, sponsored by our Lutheran students of Appalachian. Uh, so work on your chili recipes, uh, get them ready for Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, the winner of the chili cook-off gets to keep this for a year, sign their name to the coveted trophy of our chili bowl. Uh, but also uh, at the lunch, all kidding aside, we'll get a chance to hear from LSA about their plans for some of the service that they'll be doing on spring break. And so make sure you can, you can be there if possible. It'll be a wonderful, fun day and a good day to hear what our campus ministry students will be up to in March.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, creator of darkness and light, word of truth sweeping over the waters. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God, our rock and refuge, we pour out our hearts before you. We have known you, but have not always loved you. We have wounded one another and sinned against you. We have not always recognized the Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us. Remember your covenant, renew your creation, restore us that we might proclaim your good news to all. Amen. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. God has spoken. The time of grace is now. In Jesus, the reign of God has come near. By the authority of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are God's beloved. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Everlasting God, you give strength to the weak and power to the faint. Make us agents of your healing and wholeness, that your good news may be known to the ends of your creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. As soon as Jesus and the disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Our reading from Mark today is sort of split into two sections. We have uh, what happened in the evening of one day and then what happened the next morning. Uh, so Jesus and the disciples go are leaving the synagogue after that interaction with the first exorcism that we talked about last week. Uh, and they go to Simon Peter's mother-in-law's home, and Jesus heals her and heals others and casts out demons. And there's a lot to be said about what happens in that evening. But what I find to be striking is what happens the next morning. There's a pattern in Jesus' ministry that's worth taking note of. That every time there's some kind of momentum... Every time the crowds begin to press in on Jesus and there starts to be some excitement, whether it's about his healing or exorcisms or teaching, Jesus takes that moment to step back or to pump the brakes or to slow things down a little bit. So in the morning, after all this exciting night and everybody from town pressing in on the household, Jesus goes off on his own while it's still dark, to a deserted place, and there he prays. This may sound familiar because Jesus does this exact thing, stepping away to pray more than once in the gospel. Maybe the most memorable of which is in the last week of Jesus' life, in the Garden of Gethsemane. He'll invite these same disciples 
to stay awake with him while he retreats to pray. In fact, that last time in the garden, Jesus is inviting the disciples to participate in this practice that he begins here in the first chapter of Mark's gospel, and that is taking a moment to retreat, taking a moment to pray. But it does have us, or at least me, filled with a little bit of a question. What exactly is happening in this prayer time? Why does Jesus need to pray? There's maybe at least two explanations, maybe others, but two that I thought about. Maybe Jesus is just trying to teach the disciples how to sustain in ministry in a way that stays connected to the speaking of God and the movement of the Holy Spirit. That from time to time, disciples need to step away to a quiet or deserted place and enter into a time of prayer and meditation and opening oneself to the guidance of God. So is he just practicing that in front of them? Or does he actually really need that? And that's the question I've been wrestling with this week. When Jesus steps away to pray, is he just sort of saying, hey, disciples, this is how it works. You step away and you pray. Or is he actually doing what the disciples also need to do? And it might sound like a semantic argument, but the implications are actually pretty big. If Jesus is just practicing this in front of the disciples, it means that he already knows the answer of what's next. He doesn't need to pray and be in some sort of conversation with God to figure it out. It's more about than, as disciples, going away to pray to receive God answers to our questions. But if Jesus is going out into the wilderness to figure it out, something very different is happening. Now, we only really hear a part of the prayer from the Garden of Gethsemane. It's why I talked about it earlier. And that prayer felt a lot more like Jesus was wrestling things out with God. Of course, we get into some Trinitarian questions of uh, uh, distinctness and sameness and things like that. Let's not talk about that right now. But suffice it to say, if you read the interaction uh, uh, the turmoil within Jesus, wrestling this out. What is next? Maybe that's what's happening here in this moment. A wrestling and a figuring out alongside God what the next best step forward would be. The implications then is that might be what our lives of faith are to be. That from time to time it's maybe worth stopping retreating, and entering into a time of, I'd say, conversation which includes listening with God. But maybe more importantly, a time of wrestling it out, working it out with God, and discerning the next best step forward. But the implication there is that God might be figuring it out alongside of us. And that is a very big idea. So often when we talk about God, we imagine God, uh, the creator or the father, really very distant from us. One that's got this, this magical, perfect plan, and everything's going to fall in line for the faithful. Of course, we know that's not true in our own lives. Or, the problem, of course, is us. But what we, then happens is, if this is what our belief is, is that God's really just about trying to get us on God's program, then our time of prayer is really about figuring out what God already has in mind. But if what happens here in this text is the same thing that happens in the Garden of Gethsemane, it means that God is wrestling out something good for us and figuring it out alongside us in the moment. It's a very different picture of how God interacts with us. No longer is God in some heaven distant 
far away from us. But instead, God is intimately near, intimately close, and alongside us in the wrestling out process. Which means that prayer looks like trying to figure out, alongside God, what good can come from this. The challenge with that view of who God is is that it means that God doesn't have some perfect tract for our life. It means that God doesn't have some perfect answer or magical solution. It means that we participate in God's making of something good. Regardless of how we understand what exactly happens, though, the invitation is the same. Our lives probably are too often in forward momentum, and they may need a stop. They may need a retreat, even. In order to properly see the world around us, and also to begin to imagine what a next good step forward might be. So much of our world tells us that the only way to make progress is to make it bigger and better all the time. And you always have to be going forward. And the truth is that sometimes we need to retreat in order to be filled, in order, in order to have a clearer sense after wrestling it out with God about what's next. And I think that's probably true for us. Maybe we've even had an experience like that. But it's certainly not something that we like to do very often. In a couple of weeks, we'll have Ash Wednesday, and we'll turn the page to Lent. The season of Lent is designed to be a whole season of stepping back and retreating, wrestling things out with God. And one more final thing. Sometimes I worry in my own prayer life that prayer looks like one of two things. We either demand things from God, or we demand answers from God. Give us what we want or give us answer to our question. And most of our prayers have a lot of words and then they end. But if what we're doing is what Jesus is doing, then it should look a little bit more like a conversation and a wrestling out, which means that for every demand and request, which might be appropriate, probably should be matched by equal times of silence, wondering, listening. One final thing. If we're figuring this out with God, it means that we probably need to approach each other with a whole pile more humility than we normally do. We can't say we have the God answer. We can say that... Here's where we feel God's leading us. Here's where we feel the Spirit moving. But in truth, we only know in hindsight that God has been present. And I think that's okay. I actually, I think it's really good and maybe healthy for us. Maybe the church needs to be taken down a couple pegs so that we aren't the keeper of everything that's godly, the keeper of everything that's good, keeper of the secret magical God answers to every question we might have. Instead, we're the people that figure it out along the way. We're the people that wrestle it out with God and try to make a pathway towards something good. Amen.
With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all of creation. God of life, this world, this universe, are brought forth from your imagination and word. All that we see and all that we are is created in love by you. Tune our eyes to view all that is around us and within us with that same love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of justice and peace, you call us beyond ourselves to love enemies, to work alongside each other for the common good. Raise up leaders who will seek these ends of justice and mercy. Embolden those with power to speak words that move us in the direction of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, your spirit moves through and inspires the work of the church. Be with Bishop Eaton as she continues her time away from the office of presiding bishop. Be with Bishop Tim on sabbatical. Be with leaders of the church here at Grace who are discerning the movement of the Spirit as it inspires the mission of our congregation, which shares the love of God so that all are served and supported. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, you draw near to the brokenhearted. Be with all those in our community who are sick, grieving, dealing with addiction and loneliness. Remind us that we are never alone, that you are always with us. And help us, your church, be physical, ever-present reminders of this promise in the lives of those who need it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the lives of the saints you've placed before us, that through their faithful witness, we might find inspiration for our own lives, encouragement when the road becomes challenging, and hope that despite our difficulties at times, we may be able to share your love boldly with those who most need it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear these prayers we raise up and those that rest on our hearts now. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always and also with you. Our worship continues now with the offering. You can use the QR code on our screen to go over to our website where you can donate in support of our mission. And you'll also see opportunities to support many of our community partners. And I have to tell you that in the, just the last week alone, uh, Sabina was keeping a list in the office and we had 12 requests come in for, for help for members of the community. Uh, there's just a lot of need right now in our community partners, Hospitality House, 
Hunger and Health Coalition and many others are trying to meet those needs. And so uh, I'd like to raise up those uh, community partners that we have on our website, which are helping to meet those immediate needs at a time of crisis for so many of our, our friends in the community. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Holy One, for all good things come from you. In bread and cup you open heaven to us. Meet us at this table, that we receive what we seek and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us, singing. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sin, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
God who names you, Christ who claims you, and the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, bless you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace. You are God's beloved. Thanks be to God.